Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of History After Hours. My name is Kevin Bumphrey, and with me, like normal, is Mr. Ron Franklin and Mr. Jeremy Nixon. But also on this podcast, we have another history teacher from Lakeside joining us, Miss Emily Diedrich. She is coming in and helping us out with this Collective Coffee Live podcast. The date is March the 2nd, 2023. It was a little stormy out, so we didn't have quite as many students come down, but the students that were there were awesome. They were asking a lot of great questions. And so with that, I hope you enjoy the podcast. All right, we are back at Collective Coffee. It is March the 2nd, 2023, and we have a bunch of students looking at us. It is storming outside, so there's a little fewer students than normal, but I'm sure there's twice the excitement. We also have someone with us, Uh, another history teacher down the hall. All right, Brett, you can do a round of applause for Miss Deidre joining us. There we go. Listen, I mean, uh, I'm not going to say, I don't want to make you nervous, so I'm not going to say, oh, it's brave for you to be here. But, you know, it's kind of brave for you to be here. First time out, so, you know, but don't go easy on her just because it's her first time. Like, come up with some hard-hitting questions, and we're going to let her answer first. I'm kidding. <laughs> just, whatever happens, happens. All right, so, yeah, we ready? Excellent. All right, so how we're going to do this this time, come up to Miss Diedrich, and she'll lean over. Okay, there we go. Yeah, she'll hold the mic. You just speak into it. State your name and ask your question. Hi, I'm Ellie Oldrick. Uh, And my question today is, if all of humanity was destroyed and Earth was completely devastated, and then later aliens found the planet, what one item or medium or whatever would you leave behind to prove that humans existed? I know what I don't want them to find, one of your phones. (laughs) To go, to go through it to prove what we've been doing. Exactly. Uh, I don't know what I would leave behind. What's probably, what, what will they will probably find most is plastic Walmart bags. Oh. There was a show called like After Humans. Oh, yeah. And like what would be left after 50,000 years if humans disappeared and animals took back over. And, then, and you keep on going. And it's stuff like the only signs that we humans would ever be here in like 150,000 years would be like, there would, the pyramids would still be around to some degree. The Hoover Dam, because of the concrete that it's made out of. Mount Rushmore. The Great Wall of China. But there's not many. There's just a handful of things that actually... Everything else would be gone. And nature would eat it back up. So I would leave something that's like granite. Or something mm-hmm. that can last a while. Would, with would, name we, would we want to um, sanitize... What we leave behind, not, not to show the, the negative part of who we are. Like, what, what was the, what was the, the glowing thing that we would want them to know? Like, let's propagandize it. Like, oh, man, these people must have been awesome, even though, you know, we're shady. Exactly. That's a, I mean, it's a good question, but I'm not sure. Yeah, the, the best of humanity, what could we offer? I mean, would music survive in any way, shape, or form? I don't know. In, in a digital format that they could in, oh, de- de-encrypt you know, oh, yeah. and figure that out? I mean, we've done that with space, right? What was it, the Voyager... Uh, spacecraft. They, they, there's an, uh, there's a, an actual vinyl. I mean, there's records on there, so that if some alien form out in the space somewhere finds it, like they'll, they'll hear like Beethoven and you know. Yeah, I can't remember exactly I think this, I what think they like recorded. Like whales or something, maybe there's on there as well. Oh, mine's just really ironic because the first thing Nixon said was, "I hope it wasn't a phone." Mine was going to be a phone, but that's <laughs> maybe it's an age thing because I'm younger. I document everything on my phone, so. It would be very realistic. I think it would be okay if it were yours. I worry about theirs. But, fair, yeah. fair. Yeah, show of hands. How many people would want alien civilizations to go through your phone to find out about your life? It's their, it's their research. I mean, it wouldn't matter. You're long gone. But would you be comfortable with that, just knowing that some civilization judged all of humanity based on what you have on your phone? <laughs> yeah? No? <laughs> Not very many. The FBI in, the, in China are already doing it, so. That's it's true. Well, yeah. TikTok and the Patriot Act yeah. can't stop them. My name is Joshua Whedon. I was wondering, what is your favorite music genre and why? That sounds like a Kevin question. I agree. A fan. Well, I grew up in the 90s, and I was definitely a product of that. And if you would have asked me in the 90s, it would depend on when. But I think at the end of it, if I had to be in a band and I had to play music every night, like you don't want to play grunge, it's too depressing. 
but pop punk, like the Blink-182 Green Day style, I think that's something I could, or, you know, and then it morphed into like Maroon 5, Incubus, all that. I could do, I could go down that lane, and that's how my brain works, is like, what could I play every night without getting tired of it? That's the style I would play. Anything else I think I would get tired of, but that's my 90s brain coming out. Mm, I'm a product of like multiple decades worth of really freaking cool music. So late 60s when I was born, early 70s. I, I, so I, that, I think that's where I tend to, to go mostly. I, I, I revert back to what we call classic rock, I guess, at that point. So Led Zeppelin... Uh, ZZ Top, really a lot of blues-based stuff, actually. Um, but my dad was like a 50s guy, like a 50s doo-wop sort of thing. And so I have a little bit of that in the background there, too. By the so, way, he's our perfect fan for my band, Sensory 2. That's, yeah, like I know. That's what we play. I, I know every song y'all play, basically. So but so it just matter, it depends on what mood I'm in, honestly. Like, So do I want to go like heavy things like you know Black Sabbath, or do I want to do something mellow like the Eagles? Um, but then, you know, I also lived through the 80s, which was like, Happy Fun Time MTV, you know, early stuff. So it's a lot of pop there, hair bands, and uh, yeah. and then you get into grunge later on, you know. So I don't know, throw a little disco in there. Why not? You know, <laughs> blues, soul, funk, pop. I mean, I, I really it's hard for me to narrow that down because I listen to just about everything, honestly, except pop country. That just irritates me for some reason. I just can't make myself like it. I, tr- I try, I just can't. Country, great. Outlaw Country, especially from the 70s, excellent. Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson, right? Yeah, so there, that works. Yeah, I listen to just about everything. I'm like you, there's, if you, you know, look at my my playlist and phone, stuff like that, it has everything. All um, Taylor Swift. No, there's <laughs> not one, not one. You, that's, yeah. what, okay, not one. For, the, for the people who haven't <laughs> been here in the past who have heard, Go on your tirade about what is it about Taylor Swift that oh, just irks you so badly? I'm just so r- r- many. I know things. the story, but I want them to know the story because they haven't experienced. Well, like you want, yeah, no, you want the it. biggest yeah. one, yeah, or you it. want like the laundry list? No, just do it. Yeah, just whatever comes to mind. Oh, well, I mean, you hate Taylor Swift because fill in the blank. Go. Well, the number one reason is she's overtly litigious, and she tries to trademark and and copyright things that are not. Original. Okay, lawyer man, calm down. You want to explain what litigious means to these people? She likes to sue people. She likes to sue small businesses. She likes to copyright things that people have been saying for decades. She's uh, exploitative. She likes to make money off of other people's ideas. Uh, It's nothing original. Sorry, she's not. Uh, She's not really a good person when you look at the lawsuits that she's filed. Like, I really don't have anything good to say. You can't. Okay, so is there anything. non-legal about Taylor Swift. You, I mean, can you go like, oh, well, she has nice hair? I mean, what can you do with that? Anything? No. Nothing. Okay. No. <laughs> Not even that, huh? No. <laughs> Country Taylor Swift, pop Taylor Swift. The world without Taylor Swift. The world without Taylor Swift. Um, I'll be at Taylor Swift April 1st. <laughs> 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 You, hey, you got in the lottery to get yeah. Taylor Swift tickets. I got you? the yeah. tickets, yeah. yeah. And I remember battle. when all that was going on and the whole Ticketmaster meltdown thing was happening, right? And there were people that were so nervous, you know? They said, like, after the fact, after the whole ticket debacle, that it's like, if it were, if you were getting into college, it would be the same as getting into Harvard, D- getting tickets. Well, that's an, that's a, an interesting... Well, it's only 5% of analogy. people that were attempting to get tickets got it or something like that. So, okay, here... Do you think that it was a Taylor Swift slash Ticketmaster conspiracy to create controversy so more people would try to rush in and get the tickets? So creating scarcity, therefore driving up the prices, especially on the resale level. Yes. Woo. Which is another reason for you to hate her. Yes. Okay. But I mean, from a business, she's a businesswoman, right? I mean, she makes money. Yeah, that's my thing. Like if you applauded her for being a businesswoman, that's the thing I'll give her. That's the one thing. You, I, I, I'm sensing a response. Um, Taylor Swift is, in fact, suing Ticketmaster oh, for a lot okay, well, of money. My, okay, well, throw my hypothesis out the window. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, no, it actually doesn't because huh? she, if she's going to, it could still be a marketing ploy. Mm, yeah, ah. because you don't see her, you don't see her distancing herself. You don't see her separating from them. You don't see her like other bands did in the '90s say, "I'm not going to use your service." So she's having her cake and eating it too, if you will. She's going to keep performing at those venues, collecting that money, and try to sue them. Wow, that's a that's business smart right there. I mean, you can't even give her that. No, you're not. No, I mean, she's business business wise, she's astute. But I mean, that's not what people praise her for. That's a compliment. 
That's all I can give her. <laughs> all right. What's your right. favorite there genre? Be, Did you, you say? What's the appeal? Oh, my. What's the appeal, so, what is the appeal for you for Taylor Swift? Just because you grew up in that? Uh, I, yeah. I think the main thing is, is I grew up with Taylor Swift from beginning to now being an adult, seeing her more adult music, seeing the rewrites of traditional songs that I grew up with at a young age. Yeah. Um, Honestly, when I was super, super young, well, not super young, but beginning of Taylor Swift, I wasn't a huge fan. Maybe it was a switch to more popish music um, for Taylor that. Is, is she the most me popular in. performing artist in, in the United States right now, you think? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. Solid like, I don't follow all the ticket sales, but I wonder if she has, like, are people clamoring for her tickets more than anybody else's tickets? I just wonder. Probably. It's just a, it's a, it's an interesting yeah, I phenomenon. I think her, this stadium tour broke Madonna's record. Oh. I think. All right. Next question. My name is Jacob Moss. And what are the most common misconceptions in history or law? <laughs> Let them eat cake. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. The propagandized against uh, Marie Antoinette in the uh, French Revolution. I don't know. Yeah. Like, what, go, okay. So he said and or law. So you were having this conversation before when you guys were going through your, what was it, this Fourth Amendment stuff, the Bill of Rights? Like, are there like huge misconceptions oh, yeah. about what people, who, what rights you have? I see people on like cop shows and stuff when they're being arrested and they go, you can't do this, I know my rights. And then honestly, you I don't bet they probably rights. don't actually know their rights and what authority figures can and can't do to them. Like, I wonder, is it, can you expand on that? Well, I mean, one of the things that people say, I can say what I want, I have free speech. Well, not really. I mean, free speech protects you from government action, but people saying, oh, I, they can't ban me on Twitter. Sure they can. They're a private company. They can do whatever they want. You agree to their service and their terms and conditions. It is kind of funny when you hear people go, it's censorship. Yeah, Because no, no, no. censorship really refers to government, government actions against you. A private company banning you from their platform is a private company banning you from the platform. It's like kick, getting kicked out of Waffle House like <laughs> for whatever. I don't know why you get kicked out of Waffle House. I don't know what their rules are. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Misconceptions. Well, I don't. I mean, you can go down the list of things that are myths that people believe. We could talk about that. But to me, overall in history, the biggest problem with history is that it's very difficult to drill down to fact and truth. And so you can take something very simple like the American Revolution and realize very quickly it's not simple. Oh, it's about taxes. Well, to a few people. But it could also be about religion. It could be about... There's so many things you could tie in. And that's just one instance. We try to simplify history into this. It was this way or this way. When they were human beings that didn't know what was going to happen, they're as complicated as we are. And so, yeah, there's nuance in everything. And I don't... You know, the, the shame, I guess, and maybe the interesting thing about history is we won't ever really know what it was like. That's the thing that I like. I like to research and research, even knowing that I'll never get there and understand. But, you know, the way we teach it, we teach it like this is the way it is. But we don't even really know how it was because we weren't there. So that's kind of an overall misconception in yeah. history. I mean, you do the best with what you've got, with the resources available. And I've heard this a lot of times, especially when kids come into the 10th grade and they start, we start to dispel all of these rumors that they've heard before that they think are true. Whatever history piece that we're talking about, you know, oh, uh, oh, I didn't know it was like that. Right? Because what happens is you tell little kids narratives, especially like little kids with patriotic narratives. Oh, these were the founding fathers and here's how we deify them and yada yada. And here's what they believed and, and the soul of the nation. And we were this unified thing against, uh, that's a big one for me. Because I remember being a kid thinking, well, everybody hated England. No, I mean, most people did not want to separate from England in the revolutionary uh, moment. It was a few people in Boston who kind of really got the thing rolling and then had to convince everybody else to join in. And even with the revolution itself ongoing, so many people were like, I, this is not, you know, how many, how, I wonder what the percentages of people who went back to England during well, that conflict first, were. The first thing is there were, England had 26 colonies, 13 rebelled, but... 13 didn't, and they stayed loyal to the crown. And easily, South Carolina and Georgia could have stayed loyal to the crown. We just thought all America seceded and, you know, revolted, but half the colonies stayed loyal and never did it. So, you know, it's just, it's very complicated. Like I say, we're, we're humans, we're complicated. The first one I thought of was the let them eat cake thing, but I think that's a more recent topic with what we've been teaching yeah. in class. So I got that one a lot. Um, aliens built the pyramids. <laughs> no, Only someone human likes beings the, through hard work and endeavoring. Yeah, the alien theory. I love it. It's so theory. easy though for people to do that. You oh know? sure. Yeah. Is, do you think it's the fault of that guy on History Channel? Yes, the guy with the big hair. Yes, I ancient do. aliens or isn't that that guy? I don't know his name. Big hair guy. No, yeah. it's a great meme though. 
All right. Next question. My name is Grayson Farner. Oh, and here comes. You already know. <laughs> My question is, who in history had the most influence after their death, excluding religious leaders? Oh, Sir Isaac Newton. That's the most important scientist to ever live. We depend on science. Final answer. <laughs> <laughs> excluding religion, you said? Man, I mean, I don't know. It's a, it's a knee-jerk response for me, but I kind of go to Napoleon because so many things changed after his story. And maybe it's because we just got through teaching it that why it's fresh on my mind. But uh, it, it's you, no, his story doesn't end with him, you know. It doesn't end with his death out there in St. Helena. All of the different rebellions in the 1800s in Europe and across in, into, uh, into, let's say, Latin America – uh, the, the Haitian Revolution. So many, so many stories depend on what he did. Uh, Italy's creation, Germany's creation, and all the stories that came after that. With especially when I think about Germany and how they basically tried to take over the rest of the planet once they formed up in 1871. Like that, you can thank Napoleon for that story. Ultimately, if you tie that back. So, I mean, that's it's. There's you know sometimes we think about history and you go well in this moment there's a before and an after. Sometimes there's people that's a before and an after. And he's one of those guys. Like, there's a story before Napoleon, and then there's a, a dead stop, and then things shift after him. So, I mean. That one's kind of breaking my brain at the moment. Um, I've got a close second. Columbus. Oh, well, uh, yes. Crap. Okay, <laughs> but, you know, that's that that's <laughs> I, seemingly more. He's more and more debated, and I don't know if you'd say relevant, but the, the impact. How is, it, how is he irrelevant? Well, no, I'm not saying, like, He's irrelevant, but it, he's brought back into different types of conversations now. You know what I'm saying? Well, like it's expa expanded into um, more of a social impact now oh, in context. Uh, oh, uh, okay, yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. For somebody who, you know, pieces together two halves of the human race that haven't seen each other in 10,000 years, like that's yeah pretty consequential. In my opinion, yeah. the most influential event to ever happen to humans was the discovery of America and the Columbian exchange that followed because mm -hmm. Lee Erickson discovered America and then left. Right. But the discovery of America and then that, I mean, just think about how it affected South America and Central America with Catholicism and just, I mean, all of it. I mean, but the whole world and the disease. And so maybe Columbus, nah, Sir Isaac Newton. <laughs> Oppenheimer. You have a different. Ooh, oh, that, that question really made me think I would have to like, really think on that one pretty hard yeah yeah there's too many to yeah yeah and it's, long term that's a effects. that's a good one that's tough do go down with oppenheimer though that's a good one too well you know i i have become death the destroyer of worlds right it's robert oppenheimer the father of the atomic bomb yeah yeah the the nuclear age that we all live in based on that guy's work and accomplishments that's a weird word to yeah that's a, well that's kind I, of what well, they like, did they accomplished it and, the proof that the theory works. Yeah, well, that's right. true. Light that up. And now we still live in constant fear of what it can do. Yeah, sweet. Yay. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> By the way, third place, Gutenberg. <laughs> you have this too. Like, uh, this is stuff I think about. <laughs> this is 20 years of me pondering this exact question. Like five minutes for I'm me to come up with Sal one. <laughs> from China that invented paper. Einstein, uh, yeah. number five. I could keep going. I think okay. it's because you have the wall. Like You Alexander think in this the great. way. Oh, Alexander's a good one. Yeah, I'm a, yeah, I like rankings. What about a modern guy? What about like um oh, I don't know, who's the Apple guy? Gorbachev? Oh, no, not, Steve Jobs? Yeah, Steve Jobs. What about Steve Jobs? Yeah. Yeah. That's Excellent. all I got. All right, cool. Thanks. My name's William Ivy and my question is, what is your favorite book and why? Ooh, I have so many. That's I have so few that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not the best or biggest reader, but my favorite book, probably just because I grew up in Hot Springs and I have a signed copy of this book. And then it was, um, they tried to get rid of it there for a little bit. It's called Madam and it's the autobiography of Maxine oh, with yeah. Maxine's yeah. down here. They tried to get rid of it. What do you mean? Um, they tried to ban it. The like Arkansas government tried to get rid of it a little bit. Why? I mean, it's not the, like she didn't exist. What do you mean? The original version of it, she named people by name oh. that were involved in oh. all of these crimes oh, that's and sweet. all this yeah. stuff. So, uh, for you, okay, explain who Maxine was for the people who don't know. Okay, so you know Maxine's the restaurant bar down here on uh, Central. Um, it was originally a brothel um, and a uh, prostitution uh, ring. Yeah, a whorehouse. Okay. okay. 
<laughs> so like five um, road. <laughs> this uh, Maxine wrote an autobiography about all the different things she was involved in and the different people and naming a lot of Arkansas uh, politicians by name. Um, and so they tried to get rid of it for a little bit and then they rewrote it, gave a couple of uh, names a tweak. They and redacted then, it. Yeah. And then they, she came back out. And so I have a signed copy of it. Oh, which is, that's yeah. awesome. That is freaking cool. Yeah. Yeah. She, okay. There, there's a whole lot of stories there. Like hot springs used to be much more, um, risque, I guess is the word. Didn't they say it was like the Las Vegas before yeah, Vegas? Yeah, we, it, mm, yes. Yeah, bef- before they figured out how to bring water into the desert. Yeah, we were it. Illegal gambling, gangsters. You've seen the gangster museum stuff around. You know, I'm sure you're aware of that. Yeah. Like the secret tunnels and Capone was here, you know, and there's probably bodies in walls somewhere. Maybe <laughs> in this building, as old as it is. You never know. Yeah. Yeah. Shady history for sure. Gun battles with between sheriffs and, and gangsters in the middle of the street on Central Avenue down here by the by Spencer's Corner, you know, there's so many cool, cool, listen to me, but so some cool, man. It's more interesting than yeah, that I mean, now. it is. We're, the town's pretty, I mean, we've grown, obviously, because more people live here, and we've got, you know, a revamping of the Bathhouse Row, and it's really nice to see that sort of renaissance type thing. But still, there's this um, tameness to the, to the city that, uh, honestly, I think the city leaders, whoever, you know, designs tourism stuff or whatever, I think they could do a better job of really kind of harnessing, like, get away from the hillbilly yuck yuck crap and get, go to something that's much more sort of interesting and tangible to bring more people in. Well, and, and, and I mean, with the, you know, the baseball history is interesting, cool. But I think that that the the vibrancy of the city that we no longer sort of see, right? It's kind of buried beneath the other stuff now. Like, I think they could do a better job of shining that back up and mm-hmm. letting more people know about. Uh, I mean, the the shady parts of the history are interesting, yeah. you know. And I think more I mean, people would be, especially like hot springs during prohibition and things like that. There yeah, was right. a lot of that here and. I think you can kind of see some people or businesses playing on that, like the vault and the heist and things like that. Yeah, right. And they could do a better job on playing on some of those historical things. Yeah, it's a lot better than it used to be, though. That's true. So keep going, Hot Springs. We can get there. Yeah. Oh, did you have a you, have, you didn't do a book? I mean, mine are basically all fiction and classics that they pretty much hate because they hear me say I like them when they get assigned and hate them. The first book that got me into historical fiction was the prequel to The Da Vinci Code. It was called Angels and Demons. There's a movie about it now. But I was on the flight to Italy for the first time, and I read it, and it talked about a lot of the places, and then then being there. And I remember thinking, not only was the book good and a big mystery and all that, and I learned a lot from it, and then I got to see the places, but then I thought, man, this is the way to teach history. If, if I could take a semester and teach you the basics, and then we could just travel and see it, it would be more meaningful than sitting in a class all day, all year. But yeah, so Angels and Demons may be the first historical fiction. The, the most complicated book that I ever read that had the biggest impact on me was um, Dante's Divine Comedy. Mm-hmm. I, I read it as part of my um, research in when I was going through my master's work, and I read the entire thing and annotated it and did like r- uh, reports on it and stuff. Um, but it's, it's so well-written that the the darkest parts of that book in the inferno elements when you're down when people are going down into hell and you've seen all that like it's actually really scary and it's it's it it the the impressions that you get are foreboding and i remember feeling what i was reading you know but then oppositely when he goes through purgatory and then off into heaven like the closer he got to meeting god in that story the more this is going to sound weird i guess because even thinking back on that moment it sounds weird to me but I actually could see lights popping in my head as I was reading what I was, because I was like kind of caught up in it, you know, and it was like this uplifting, it's the complete opposite of what it was in the first set of that, uh, uh, the first book in that, right? The, the, the darkness and the evil and the, for, uh, this other part was just really, like it's, it's this weird sort of uplifting spirituality in the words themselves. And so like it's magnificent, honestly, it's, it's, a, it's a great book. I can see why it's lasted so long. I mean, think about, think about the impact that, that book's had. Most people... I, statistically, I think, I wouldn't say every person, obviously, but Christians who have this impression of what hell may be like or what heaven may be like visualize what he wrote as opposed to what's in the Gospels. And his stuff is not tech, is not is not based in Gospels necessarily. A lot of it just came right out of his head because it made sense in the storyline. Uh, but that's how, it, even you've never read that book probably or, or the large parts of it, and yet if you are Christian and you do have a concept of heaven and hell, a lot of the imagery in your head may come from that actual story. 
that's impactful. He was written in the 1300s. Yeah, he also standardized the Italian language and, and that, out of it yeah. as well. See, all the history teachers, and I'm sitting here with fiction going through my head. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I've, I've always been a reader since I was a little kid, but all my favorite books are fiction. You know, give me a picture of Dorian Gray, give me Catcher in the Rye, um, give me Fahrenheit 451, mm-hmm. give me The Handmaid's Tale. I love all, yeah. <laughs> I love those. I'll get lost in fiction. For me, reading is this, is more of an escape. Don't don't get me wrong. I can I can talk about legal books that I have and have enjoyed and history books, but by far I would rather go pick up an old familiar work of fiction than anything else. So the lawyer is also the dreamer of the group. <laughs> I like it. Uh, my name is Emily Williams, and I have a very 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 important question. When it comes to Thanksgiving. Which one is more important, mac and cheese or sweet potato pie? <laughs> I'm going mac and cheese. If it's, if it's creamy, if it's dry, then spit that crap out. You know, <laughs> I gotta, you got to have that deep, rich, thick, cheesy, cheesy mac and cheese. Yeah, that's what I, I do like that. Although sweet potato pie is good. I, I like the sweet potatoes. Golly, that's tough. Mm-hmm. I'm still going mac and cheese, mac and cheese. I'm going mac and cheese, but if... I'm going to have pie. I'd prefer it be sweet potato over pumpkin. Mm, yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I agree with her. Ah, Same thing. Like, uh, I, if we're talking <laughs> pumpkin pie, like I can chow down on some pumpkin pie, boy. Back that truck up. I'll eat that. Yeah. So, yeah. Still going with mac and cheese, though, Kevin? Yeah, I'm with her. I, I, I think I prefer mac and cheese, but of the pies, I like sweet potato more than pumpkin Although sometimes it can fool me. Man, I'm just the minority on everyone here. What's, uh, what's, your, what's your least favorite? I think we've done this before. Least favorite Thanksgiving food? Cranberry sauce. Yep. Not green bean casserole? Ugh. <laughs> I can choke that down. I don't get eating a dessert with the meal. Having that whatever. I know you're supposed to... I guess my wife taught me to put it in the gravy. I mean the dressing, whatever. <laughs> I don't like mint chocolate either. So, I mean, like, there's a lot of stuff I don't like. But that just feels like I'm eating chocolate and brushing my teeth at the same time. Well, okay. Tangential question. Ready? Fruit in jello or no? To me, that's blasphemy. Yeah. N- nah. Nah. Is that... Who, who is it that we know that puts freaking fruit in everything? Is that... It's jo- it's, okay, it's, it's, it's our brother-in-law. It's my wife's brother-in-law's mom who puts fruit in everything. And nobody likes it. But for years, she's just like, oh, here's the stuff. But fruit in banana pudding. You already have fruit in banana pudding. It's called bananas. Like, you don't need extra stuff in there. You don't need grapes. You don't need raisins. You don't need, stop. What are you doing? Like, getting crazy with the fruit cocktail. All right, next question. Step up. Hello, my name is Liam Jeffers. I um, always ask my dad if he has questions, and he always comes up dry, but he actually had a question this time. So um, he asked, if uh, Hitler died during World War I, and this is a serious question, don't worry. Um, if Hitler died during World War I, would the Nazis still come to power? Yeah, I think so. I mean, they were a know-nothing group till he came along. I mean, it would take somebody else as... Yeah, that's what I was... I mean, who's he, the number two there? Well, I don't... I mean... And I don't even he think... He dominates it, that's obvious, but I mean... There were so many political parties. Germany was being yeah. torn apart. The communists might have taken over. Uh, without Hitler being that galvanizing force, I don't see how they get as big as they... Because he was just so electrifying. Well, no, I'm, I'm not disagreeing. Not in a good way. I'm not disagreeing with the fact that he amplified their cause. I just mean that with, even before he stepped up onto the scene, there were extreme right-wing militant groups that were active. They weren't the only ones. They just happened to be the most successful one. So, I, I mean, if it wasn't them, it would have been someone else, I think. I don't know that you would have gone left. I think they would have pushed farther to the right because it's about saving the nation and, and, and weeding out all of the, uh, all of the corruption, quote unquote, in, in, the, in, the, in the, the, the processes and the people who've harnessed them for so long and break those bonds. And I, I mean, he, he was the spokesman for sure. And he, and he was, you're right, he did electrify the whole thing. But I don't know, I, I can't stand here and go, they wouldn't have moved on without him, you know? I think you're right. It would be, it'd probably be more likely to be right wing, but I don't know if it's the Nazi party, because they were such a back yeah. small political but, party at the time. Well, right, but, but Nazi is short for Nazi now, which means nationalist, and so some other nationalist group right. would have risen up. I mean, I don't know that it, it had to be them, right? Um, they just got the momentum, everybody else got sucked into it, so... 
They just had some specific dogmas that were pretty destructive at the right. end. That you could have that same national movement without. But that purge mentality, I think, was within. If you study a lot of those groups, they were very like anti-Semitic, and they were very anti-foreign power, and they were anti-communist, they were anti-democratic, they were anti-United yeah. States, they were really pissed off at France. That makes sense, you know, uh, for the people who had sold them out of the Treaty of Versailles, and they wanted to to reclaim the greatness that they had before World War One. I. I, I I just think that it was going to be that, especially when mm. you um, push them into the corner like they did after after the first war was over. Counterfactuals, we'll never know. Yeah. <laughs> Disagreement? I just kind of have a question on top of that. So oh. if it was almost, not, I don't want to say inevitable, but someone else would have risen to power and someone else would have taken control, would it, been, would it have been to the extent of what did happen during World War II? Given the dire circumstances in the society at that time and the, and the massive, like we talk about hyperinflation, I can't imagine, like, and I know the standard is always the loaf of bread, like two billion dollars for a loaf of bread, people can't afford. You're a billionaire in Germany and you can't afford food. You know, I mean, somebody that's so out of control and they've been so destroyed and and defeated, not just as a country but as a people. You know, and I think that was one of the biggest mistakes of the of the treaty that ended World War One was that that crippling hatred for German people. And they, I think, that you create a scenario and a dynamic where they're looking for a savior. And it didn't have to be Hitler. It just happened to be. Yeah, that, I mean, that I agree with. The, you know, power abhors a vacuum, right? So it doesn't matter the, if the political attitude is far right or far left. It doesn't matter if it's reactionary or radical. They just want somebody to tear it down at that point, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was, no, uh, there was no moderating that. I mean, I don't think you can find middle ground when everything was so extreme in the country at the time, right? That's, that's what I'm saying. If you could have found somebody as dynamic as him, they could have been more successful. Because he was blunder machine once, you know, well, it really got going. And then, you know, some of the packs he made was not, you know, you could, you could have seen a middle road that could have been more successful. Well, so that, that, that begs the question, though, if he hadn't let his inner demons and, and the hatreds that sort of drove them in, on the far, on the extreme version of the party that they were. I mean, they're, they were, were credited for a long time by a lot of countries, including ours, for yep. saving that country and turning their economy around and, and, and putting people back to work and, sh- and, and rebuilding Berlin and, you know, and, and giving a sense of pride to the people who had been. I mean, there were a lot of countries applauded what he did. I mean, that's, it was, yep. if you look at it just from an economic standpoint, it's, it's pretty great. Mm-hmm. But then you, have, you can't separate the fact that it goes down those dark paths. You know, if he had stopped somewhere in, that, in those first phases where things had gotten better, instead of this whole conquest thing and payback, then maybe we'd know him for a different reason today, you know? Next oh, question, okay, or follow-up. Follow yeah. Do you think tiny Hitler would have come to power? <laughs> tiny Hitler. He could have snuck in there easier. It probably happened. <laughs> <laughs> He's always always lurking. He'd be in South America right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Easier time escaping. He's in Argentina. And Many or rat lines, mouse lines. <laughs> All right, next question. My name is Miles Brewster, and I wanted to ask about the Alaskan Willow Project. We learned a little bit, a little bit about it in Apes this week, and I was really curious about your opinions about it. The what now? I missed the... Yeah. The Willow Project? I just learned about this from my stepdaughter, where they're going... Biden has just approved three big drilling sites on the north slope of Alaska for oil, which, of course, can boost the economy and provide jobs, but, of course, environmentalists are pushing back. I think he's, to try to meet in the middle, he's narrowed it to two. And by the way, I spent 25 seconds reading this really quickly. But there's environmentalists that are worried about the animal life there. And of course, the using more oil is always controversial. That's all I know about it. Why, yeah. why there particularly? I mean, other than the fact that there's well, oil there. I mean, there's uh, oil, yeah. But there's oil in a lot of places we could drill. Would you like to add to our knowledge? Yeah, yeah like, give me more information yeah, about that. I don't know much. People are also worried about the indigenous people that already live there. They're going to be displaced. And the, the government is saying, like, hey, it would create more jobs. But a lot of them don't want to work there. They don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just because there's been, like, a very large pocket of oil found there that hasn't been. Okay. Haven't they it's seen been, Avatar? This is what happens, people. <laughs> it's been in place since, like, Trump's presidency. Like, it's been... Not announced, but, like, prompted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no easy solution. Now, once again, remember that misconception about how we try to look at things simply? You know, I'm sure there's a lot of big percentage of the Alaskan state that is really for this. 
obviously it means a lot more money in circulation in the economy and it could be really good. But then you look at the flip side. I don't have that answer, of course, but I'm sure there's a lot more questions that will arise from this. You know, there, there is a push for electricity being the answer to everything, but we know that's not really true either because how we actually produce electricity and the batteries, what's the components in the batteries that you have to dig oh, you're, for. You're talking about the battery cars and all that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, cobalt. We, we still have children mining cobalt for the batteries, which would just oh, greatly increase if everything was electric, besides the fact that we burn a lot of coal and use oil to produce electricity in some places. Wind and solar is not enough. Nuclear could be an answer, but there's a lot with that. So, I mean, we could talk about the energy situation being complicated for two so, weeks. So they have approved the, the permits for them to start drilling. Do we know who is going to accept those permits and start drilling? I, I wonder, I wonder who that's going. the first I've heard of it. I mean, it just reminds me, of, I don't know how many years ago now, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge drilling mm -hmm. and the controversy over that and... I, these things crop up every few years, and we, it feels like we have the same fight over and yeah. over. Um, but, I mean, I think Kevin's right. It's what do you do at, with the position we're at now, uh, with the dependence level that we're at now? Okay, here's a controversial position. Do the wants, needs, and desires of the indigenous people override the wants, needs of American society to have more oil, energy, created by our own production rather than for foreign powers. I mean, do you really have to stop? And again, I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm just throwing this out here for discussion. Do you stop industry and productivity there because a handful of indigenous people are going to be pissed off about it? Yeah, I mean... That's I, a fair I, question. Yeah, I think that's, that is the question. I think we have to figure out a way to coexist and maybe, obviously, financially... So don't run the people. pipeline through their village? Right. I mean, no. I mean, maybe if you have to relocate them, it's financially beneficial for them to be relocated. It's but then a little of course, touchy when you start relocating native I'm people. A, hey, I'm not saying we should do it. I mean, we, but, no, I know. Yeah, I know you're not saying but that. But there's got to be, there, there has to be what's best for the most amount of people is always kind of where I land. Well, and we're looking at this from the U.S. perspective, but if you look at Nigeria, the, they've done the exact same thing in the Southeast region. They've uh, gone through indigenous lands, they've taken them, they've rav ravaged them the oil, they don't have uh, clean drinking water, they don't have. Um, any of the profits because it's government and corrupt, government run and corrupt. So, I mean, we're looking at it from the U.S. when in reality this is a global issue that we can't solve. Also, Alaska don't. is the only state in the union that receives a, every citizen of Alaska receives a, I think, a $2,000 oil stop in every year. And that could actually increase, which, which was approved year after year by a Republican government and is supported by. Republicans in Alaska. So it's an so, interesting, so weird situation. So the indigenous situation. people might actually profit in some way by this, by, at least by proxy, maybe. Maybe. By proxy. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's, you want to follow up? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry. I did a research project on this, so oh, okay, I know yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah, well, hey, um, yeah. Oil not only affects the indigenous people, but it's been shown to have more seismic activity. It can displace the animals that are already sure, there. Sure. It's overall already bad for environment, and oil isn't projected to really last that long as an energy resource. We're supposed to peak at 2050, and then our economy for it will very rapidly decline. Yeah. I, I know, but that, that still, right. if, I'm, if I'm taking the other side just for a moment, those things are collateral damage when it when you look at the overall picture of the needs of the nation so yeah i mean I, i'm not that's not me saying that i'm just throwing the other side out right well and we live in a capitalist consumer driven society when gas goes up to four or five dollars a gallon everybody's going to complain about it so that's the other thing I, you know we tend to pay lip service to things and i do think that we need solutions but i don't think that anyone's willing to go far enough to make them. If there's some politician out there saying that the uh, exploration and exploitation of oil in Alaska or anywhere else in America is going to drop the price of gas, that's a freaking dream. Like, that's that's not a reality because there's so many dynamics that cause the price to be what it is. Right, but we know facts don't matter in the, this political age. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> and you have to get, and it's an international thing. It's not just America when you're talking about energy production. Right. So mm. trying to get uh, major countries to agree on it's going to be, we, we, there's got to be a diversified energy solution that includes all of the sources for energy, but uh, it's getting people to agree, even in our nation, is hard enough. Well, mm. getting special interests out would be the first thing in achieving that. 
if you had to kill like one good person, like Jesus, Buddha, MLK, before they did like the good thing, who would you kill? <laughs> what? Why would we want to kill them? Had to. He said had to, not oh. want to. Yeah. I mean, I don't, that's so See, weird. I I don't know. I'm I, trying to figure out how I would approach this. I disagree with the premise because <laughs> who's to yeah. say what is good? good yeah, I, was, I, was, I was like, who, who defines good here? But if we were talking just in generic terms, I would have to sacrifice myself for the good <laughs> of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's how my loophole. <laughs> yeah, my brain went to who did the smallest good thing ever. <laughs> well, I was I was thinking the same along the same lines. I'm like, okay, Nobel Peace Prize, but it also invented dynamite kill out for Nobel. <laughs> I would make it random. I would have a random selector and I would take spin, all spin a wheel. Oh, wait, I have spin the wheels on my use it. Right. I'd take all the big powerful people out of it and it's just followers, but they're good people, so Hi, my name is Katie Brown, and my question is, how do you think the government would handle the dinosaurs coming back? Why do you know something we don't? Have you seen Jurassic Park? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I should say Jurassic not Park. well. Can they yeah, handle much well. of anything right now anyways? I mean, I think it would be um, <laughs> privatized, literally Jurassic Park kind of thing. Um, yeah, they could make some money off it. I, you know, part of me, this is gonna, this is stupid, really. I know it's stupid. But part of me wants to see a real dinosaur. That's just the, that's just the eight-year-old in me, honestly. Sure. And I'm like, yeah, what were they really like? But I don't know that we could even do that with, you know, what, what was it in the movie? Like frog splicing with D- DNA. You know? yeah. So you end up with some sort of weird hybrid. I mean, I think we could get there. They Obviously, have talked about bringing things. back like woolly mammoths. The mammoths and, for the permafrost. Yeah. And the hey, Fable has a Jurassic moth or whatever it is. We yeah. got that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's not a good idea, though. <laughs> Jurassic, Jurassic Moth. Moth. I don't think that's going to draw many ticket holders. Uh, how would they respond, though? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, with these guys. I, I think that the government would go, how can we make money off this? All right, I'm Brian Pennington. Who would win in a fight out of y'all four? A fight. <laughs> out of the four of us, I'm going him. <laughs> I think it's obvious. No. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. He's got a lot of rage. <laughs> True. <laughs> I might just start crying. Uh, yeah, we would never get in a fight because... That's beneath us. We love each other. Yeah. Aww. Lock shields. <laughs> We're in this together, man. Yeah. <laughs> Say the uh, same thing I told you in the hall the other day. Other day. That's how a lot of people in history died. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all go down together. Yeah, I don't know. Band of brothers, you know. I think that's really where we are at this point. Yeah. And, and now sisters. So. <laughs> I'm Grady Oman, and how do you feel about the Arkansas Learns Act? Oh, boy. You said we only have 10 Man, minutes. And we only have five minutes. So <laughs> I, I really thought that'd be in the first five minutes. I did, too. That's, uh, I, was, I was actually waiting. Um, short answer, I, it makes me nervous. You know, uh, I, I don't think that it, it, it is what they're selling. I think in actuality, it's going to be much more complicated and problematic economically, socially, uh, uh, rural communities, which most of Arkansas is a Oh, gi- actually, we're one big, giant rural community. You know, uh, the fact that the, what they're promising—just case in point, this this ten thousand dollar bonus that they're laying out there is like this golden, you know, nugget for oh, everybody gets a raise. And okay, we just saw the the economic, the financial report on that particular thing. They're only budgeting like a like ten million dollars per year for that, which means that if you prorate that out, out of all of the districts in Arkansas, there's not enough money to give one teacher in every district or that $10,000 bonus. So it's, it's really not there. And so they've admitted that they would have to prorate that down and most people aren't going to get that money. So it's what, what they're showing you, what they're, what they're promoting is not what's really happening behind the scenes. And so a lot of us are very nervous with that, especially with things like this fair dismissal act being removed, uh, which means that our, our jobs can be in jeopardy for just about any reason at all. Uh, the retention is going to be problematic. The, the, the hiring prob- uh, aspects, the fact that our expertise isn't going to matter anymore on whether or not we're paid a certain amount. I think it's going to run people out of the system, and I think it's going to close small schools is what I think is going to happen. I um, also think parts of it are unconstitutional. Yeah, yeah, think, and, yeah, so, and lawyer side. Oh, I just think this bill is a really good example, especially for students of bills that have surface-level good things that if you glance at it, it looks good. And unless you truly understand and dive into it, you don't have that understanding or even – a lot of it as you have to be an educator to truly understand the effects that it's going to have because I spent one class period one time just showing them a table of contents and a glance and they're like, well, paid maternity leave, isn't that a good thing? Minimum salary of teachers, $50,000, isn't that a good thing? 
Yes, but you have to read into it to see the lasting effects, and mm-hmm. the, it's not always yeah, a and, good thing. And if you think about the fifty thousand dollar raise, how many districts, especially small ones, can can actually meet that goal? Will the state actually help them? They're kind of promising that they will, but there's nothing specific in the legislation that says how they will. And so there's a lot of unknowns. Some of it sounds grand and grandiose and, oh, we're going to boost. And it's for the kids. It's really not. And some legislatures in the state and outside who have other bills similar in their states have admitted that this is a cash grab by the rich people in those states, that it is a, an all-out attack on public education in an attempt to burn it down. Like That's not me saying that. That's, those are dead quotes from people who are promoting this kind of bill across the country. And so it, ma- it makes me nervous. Like, what's this really going to be? We'll see. It's coming. I mean, it is coming. There are, the votes yes. aren't there to block it. It's Effective. going to be a reality. And, it's, and it all starts next year. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's just they're rushing it through. That's, that's the other thing, too. There's, no been, there's not been any real debate about this. Yes. Everybody just So it's great. Let's do it. And they've, they've, they've run it through yeah. all the committees in record time. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be on her desk next week, and she's going to sign it. Look, I was a state attorney for a decade. I've been in committee meetings. I've done markup on bills. I've been in sessions with the Bureau of Legislative Research. This is not how it's done. It's not how it's done. It's not never how it's been done. Uh, so there's never been a bill move this fast from committee. And if you look at bills in Arkansas, they're usually six or seven pages, not 144. And I also think one really big thing I noticed about there is the cry from teachers, educators, admin saying, whoa, slow down. Take a look at this. Let's understand it. And, and they've refused. They refused. Out, refused to listen to us. So, I mean, hold your breath. Here it comes. Yeah, thank you. All right, we're going to have to do the lightning round to get these yeah, last right. three questions bing, in. Bing, bing. So, right. Hi, I'm Danny Montgomery. And if you could shrink down any president in history, put him in your front pocket, who would it be and why? Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, Teddy Roosevelt. Just because he would protect me from Kevin if he ever went on a rampage. <laughs> and he would motivate me to win. <laughs> so we're just carrying around, around a little president? Yeah, you, you, want, you want a president yeah. that's optimistic, positive. And I Teddy think that guy's, no, he's like, he's a leader, right? Optim- he's, he's full force 24-7. I like the guy a lot. So, yeah, Teddy Roosevelt. Crazy question. We've never been asked anything like that. See, that's outside thinking right there. Okay. Uh, my name is Robert Butso, and... All four of y'all have had a Bledsoe in your class at one point. Sure enough. Who is the bless, best Bledsoe? <laughs> the best Bledsoe. I, I've only I don't had think one. I can answer that fairly. I've only had Robert. <laughs> I've only had Bartley. I've really got to start learning my students' names. I don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure I've had a few. So They come I'll, and they go. I mean, what about... I'll, just, I'll, I'll go with my current student. How about that? All right, go. I have both of them in the same class, so I can't... Oh, yeah. They're both great. If it was you four in a cage match versus Miss McAvale, who's going to win? <laughs> Linda. Every time, Linda. McAvale. Linda. I'm fueling the rage. There you go. Yeah. McAvale All right. for the win. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. That concludes Thank our podcast. Coffee. We'll see you next time. Thank you to Collective Coffee for having us Thank out. Thank you. Y'all be safe. Goodbye.